Hey everybody, now that you've learned how to use kinematic equations to solve problems in physics, we're going to get a little more practice with it. Practice makes perfect after all, and the more times you see this done, the easier time you'll have doing it yourself later. So, practice problem number two. A baseball is thrown vertically upward with a velocity of 22.5 meters per second. Gravity causes it to decelerate at a rate of negative 9.81 meters per second squared. How high is the ball after 1.5 seconds? So right away I see the word decelerate, and in a physics problem that means you can probably use one of these four kinematic equations. But which one are we going to use? Well, it depends on the information they give us, so let's try to identify what that information is. I'll start by making a diagram so I can make it a little easier to understand what's going on. Here's the baseball that's being thrown vertically upward, and there's its velocity, 22.5 meters per second squared. The problem says that gravity which of course is a force that comes from the Earth pulling things towards itself, gravity causes it to decelerate at a rate of negative 9.81 meters per second squared. Now if you're curious what that number is and why it's negative and where the heck it comes from, it's because this number, 9.81, is the amount of meters per second of speed that things gain when they're falling towards the Earth every one second. So the acceleration due to gravity is negative 9.81 meters per second squared because every second we lose 9.81 meters per second of speed. So the negative means things are being pulled downward, not upward. So the last part of this question says, how high is the ball after 1.5 seconds? So that means we're being told that the ball slows down and 1.5 seconds later, we need to find out how high it is. Now we don't actually know if the ball is going to get to its peak height here where it would eventually stop and then fall back down towards the earth. We can't safely assume that because it's not told to us in the problem. So we're going to assume it's somewhere else. So there's the ball's path that it takes um, and the displacement is what we're being asked to find. There is one more unknown but it's not a desired unknown variable because we're not being asked about it and that's the final velocity of the ball. This problem could have asked us how fast the ball is going at this point but it didn't, it's asking us for this instead. So let's do the first real part of solving a kinematic equation. Let's list out our variables. So what do we know? We don't know displacement. That's what they're asking us for in the question. We do know the initial velocity. It's 22.5 meters per second. We don't know the final velocity of the ball. We know that it takes 1.5 seconds of time for this to happen. And we know that the acceleration due to gravity on the ball is negative 9.81 meters per second squared. Now it's time for step two, where we choose which of the four kinematic equations we'll use. Now we're going to have to choose an equation that has all of the ingredients that we need. So what does it need to have? It needs to have initial velocity, it needs to have time, and it needs to have acceleration, because these are the three bits of information we have. So we want to be able to use them. And then lastly, it needs to have x, because how high is the ball means we need to solve for displacement. So our equation needs to have x, v, i, t, and a. Only one of those formulas matches these requirements, and that's this one. Da -da -da -da. So there's our kinematic equation. And I'll write it down here, and I've isolated the variable. And wait, I've isolated the variable already? Well, actually, this equation is already set up to solve for x, and we need to find x. So one step has actually been done for us. Step three usually would be rearrange this equation using algebra. But we don't need to do that because this equation is already set up to solve for x, not x squared or 2x or anything like that, just regular old x. So perfect, we can go right to step four, which is plugging in our numbers. x is equal to vi, which is 22.5, multiplied by t, 1.5, plus 1 half times a, negative 9.81, multiplied by t squared, so 1.5 squared. Now the easiest mistakes some people would make when they're doing this for the first time, they're kind of new at kinematics problems, is they might forget this negative symbol, which would mean this whole term would be positive instead of negative. That's drastically going to impact the answer. And then someone might also forget the squared here, and they might just type in 1.5 and then hit enter and stop without doing the squared. Or they might take all three of these, the 1 half, the 9.81, and the 1.5, get an answer for this term, and then square the whole thing. And that would be a mistake too, because only the t is being squared in this equation. So plugging all these numbers into your calculator, you get 21.7 meters. So how high is the ball after 1.5 seconds? It's about 21.7 meters high up in the air. Pretty cool. 
Practice problem number three. I'm giving you a nice little animation here instead of our typical diagram. A train pulls into a station at a speed of 25 meters per second. It applies its brakes and decelerates at a rate of 2.5 meters per second squared. How long until the train stops? Okay, so again, I see the word decelerate, and that means I can use a kinematic equation. So now I know what my basic strategy is. Let me identify the information they gave me. First of all, they gave me that the train starts out at 25 meters per second when it's entering the station. They also told me that it is decelerating at a rate of 2.5 meters per second squared. That's the rate at which it's losing speed. That's actually why I'm making it negative. And it's also, I could also justify it this way, um, the train is originally moving in what we would consider the positive direction. It's moving to the right, which we consider in physics to be positive motion. But the acceleration is actually causing it to decelerate or slow down. So it's affecting it in the leftward direction. So since the acceleration is making it move kind of more towards the left instead of the right, we would call it negative acceleration or deceleration. And we mark that with a negative symbol. So what else did they tell us? Well, the question itself actually contains some useful information. It asks, how long until the train stops? So stops is a word that tells you that it comes to rest at the end. So I can assume that the final velocity of this train over here will end up being zero meters per second. So now I have three knowns. What are my unknowns? Well, I don't know how much time this took, and I don't know how much distance the train covers while it's slowing down. So let me list out my variables. Step one. Do I know displacement? No, I don't. Do I know initial velocity? Yes, I do. Do I know final velocity? Yes, I do. We assume it starts at 25 and ends at zero. Uh, do I know the time? No. Do I know the acceleration? Yes. And I made sure to mark that as negative. That will affect the math that we do. Now on to step two. Which kinematic equation contains vi, vf, a down below, and also the one that we're solving for, how long? Well, how long could be interpreted to mean the length of something physically, like how many meters of length, but in this context, how long until the train stops, you can tell they're talking about a length of time before an event takes place. So that's gonna be T. So we want the four bottom variables. In other words, we're looking for an equation that does not have X, because we're not told displacement, and we don't need to find displacement. So when you're picking a kinematic equation, just pick the one that doesn't have the thing you don't need. So which one does not have X? That would be this one. Da -da -da -da. There's our kinematic equation. Let's write it down and let's isolate the variable that we need, which in this case is t. We're asked how long until something happens, so we need to solve for this variable before we plug in any numbers. Here's my strategy. I want to get t by itself, and right now it's being multiplied by this a, and that whole term is being added to vi. So I'm gonna break up this relationship here, this addition between the vi and the a times t, this can be gotten rid of the easiest. The best way to undo addition is to subtract. So I'm gonna subtract vi from both sides of the equation and that will end up moving it over to the left. So step three might look something like this. I've subtracted vi from the right side over to the left side. Now it looks like vf minus vi equals a times t. And again, I'm trying to isolate t, I'm trying to solve for it and get it by itself. What's the best way to get rid of this a? Well, the a is being multiplied by t. How do you undo multiplication? Well, you divide. So I'm gonna divide this side of the equation by a, and then to be fair, divide this side of the equation by a, and it will look something like that. So now it says time equals final velocity minus initial velocity divided by acceleration. Now we're ready for step four, plug in our numbers. What was the final velocity? Well, the train stops, so it's zero. What was the initial velocity? 25. And what was the acceleration? Negative 2.5. This is really important that you remember that this is a negative acceleration, not a positive acceleration. Remember the train was slowing down and getting slower and slower every second. So if I had plugged in a positive here, I would actually end up getting negative 25 divided by a positive number, and my time would end up being negative. That doesn't really make sense. There's a couple things in physics that never should end up being calculated as negative. One of them is mass, mass can't be negative, and also time can't be negative. So this is why that negative mathematically was important. It's because I have a negative number divided by a negative number, which gives me a positive answer of 10. So the train will slow down in 10 seconds.
For our last problem today, practice problem four, I'm actually taking the exact same scenario with the same train, all the same information, and I'm changing the information that I provide and the information I'm asking for. Question four says, a train pulls into a station at a speed of 25 meters per second, same as before. It applies its brakes and stops in a time of 10 seconds. You might recall that this is the answer we just got in practice problem number three. So this is still the same train slowing down the same way in the same amount of time, so nothing has physically changed here. But now I'm asking, what is the train's stopping distance? Well, what's stopping distance? That's the distance that something will move while it's trying to come to a complete stop. This is important if you're getting your driver's license because if you're not paying attention to the road and you're looking at your phone or a bird or something, the stopping distance of your car is how far your car will keep moving even after you hit the brake. So this is pretty important stuff to know. So what are we gonna do first? We're gonna identify the information we're given. Just like last time, the train is starting out traveling at 25 meters per second when it enters the station. It travels for 10 seconds and that was something we didn't know last time, but in this version of the problem, we're being told that directly by the problem, so we can write it down right away. And we're also able to assume that the train will come to a stop because we're asked, what is the train's stopping distance? So it's gonna stop, we can logically assume that. What are we not told? We're not told the distance that it takes to stop the train, so the displacement is unknown to us. And in this particular case, we're not directly told what the acceleration is. Now in the last problem we were told this, and I did say this is exactly the same scenario playing out, so really if we wanted to we could use that information, but I'm pretending this is a brand new problem I've never seen before, so I'm going to consider this an unknown, even though in the last problem it was negative 2.5. Okay, so first part of solving a kinematics problem, write out your knowns and your unknowns. The displacement, well that's unknown to us, we need to solve for it. The initial velocity, 25. The final velocity, 0. The time it takes for all this to happen, 10 seconds. And acceleration is unknown in this case. What's my equation I'm gonna choose for step two? Okay, let me see, I need x and I have vi, vf, and t. So I need one that doesn't have a. So which kinematic equation is missing a? And that is this one, da 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 da. You knew this one was coming because it's the only one I hadn't used yet. So here's this kinematic equation being used. In this case, we need to solve for x and hey, that equation actually already solves for x, so I can skip stage three like I did in a previous problem and not bother rearranging the equation because it's already set up the way I need it. So I'm moving right on to the last step. Step four says plug in your variables. So displacement will be equal to the initial velocity, 25, plus the final velocity, zero, divided by two, and then multiplied by the time it takes for all this to happen, 10 seconds. The answer turns out to be 125 meters, and that's a pretty reasonable answer for a train station. It's about one-tenth of a kilometer, which is kind of like a mile. So this is a pretty long distance for a person, but not really for a train. All right, so with those three extra kinematics problems under your belt, you should be well prepared to tackle them yourself. Good luck out there. See you in the next video.